You hear a lot about traditional Chinese herbal medicine, but less about the herbs used in Japan. Uh, there's a root called Rhizoma coptididis uh, that appears to have similar anti-acne activities to a drug like Accutane, a drug infamous for its side effects, before it was pulled from the market. But there are side effects to the root, too. A poor fellow took it to clear up his skin and made things worse. The anti-acne active component of the root is thought to be berberine. Any way to get the active ingredient in a safer plant? Yes, apparently, barberries. You may remember barberries as perhaps the most antioxidant-packed dried fruit available. You can find them cheap at Middle East grocers, where they're used to make a signature Persian rice dish. Their taste is described as pleasantly acidulous, which is just doctor speak for sour. I love uh, sprinkling them on my oatmeal just because they're yummy, but evidently have played a prominent role in herbal healing for thousands of years around the world, flamboyantly described in this pharmacology journal as an herbal remedy that has no match in serving the human race. And I just thought they were kind of tangy. The problem with the herbal medicine literature is that there's often a long, impressive list of traditional uses, but little or no science to back it up. And what does exist is often either in vitro or animal data that has questionable clinical applicability. Like, who cares if barberries induces a menstruation in a guinea pig? Except maybe the guinea pig. So you end up with drug companies injecting herbs into the penises of rabbits in hopes of coming up with the next Viagra but few, if any, human studies. I've seen petri dish studies like this over the years, suggesting anti-cancer effects of barberries on human tumor cells in vitro, or the anti-acne effects on hamsters, uh, but there weren't any such human studies until now. Evidently, there had been anecdotal reports of acne clearing up after barberry juice consumption, so researchers decided to put it to the test. A double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial of 50 12- to 17-year-olds with moderate to severe acne. Half got a sugar pill, the other half the equivalent of about a teaspoon of dried barberries three, days, uh, three times a day for a month. The results were remarkable. After four weeks on the placebo, no change, just as many pimples as before. But in the barberry group, a 43% drop in the number of zits, and about a 45% drop in inflamed zits. That's extraordinary. And a spoonful costs about 8 cents. No reported side effects, healthy for you anyway. The only potential concerns I could find were to not eat them during pregnancy, and we just don't have good data on barberry consumption during lactation, so best to stay away from them during breastfeeding as well. One of the most recognized consequences of aging is a decline in immune function, illustrated by vulnerability to dying from the flu, a poor response to vaccinations, but about 20 years ago, a paper was published showing that the immune cells of 80-year-olds produce significantly more pro-inflammatory signals, suggesting the worst of both worlds, a decline in the part of the immune system that fights specific infections, but an aggravation of nonspecific overreactions that can lead to inflammation. This has since been formalized in a concept referred to as inflammaging, uh, chronic low-grade inflammation we now know is typical of aging, which may be responsible for the decline in the onset of disease in the elderly. So what can we do about it? Inflammaging appears to be a major consequence of growing old. Can it be prevented or cured? The key to successful aging and longevity may be to decrease chronic inflammation without compromising an acute response when exposed to pathogens. How are we going to do that? Nutrition. What we eat is probably the most powerful and pliable tool that we have to attain a chronic and systemic modulation of the aging process. In the first systematic review of the associations between dietary patterns and biomarkers of inflammation ever published, the dietary patterns associated with inflammation were almost 
all meat-based or so-called Western diet patterns, while vegetable and fruit-based or healthy patterns tended to be inversely associated, meaning more plant-based, less inflammation. The reason why meat is associated with inflammation may be because of both the animal protein and the animal fat. In the first interventional study that separately evaluated the effects of vegetable and animal protein on inflammatory status as it relates to obesity and metabolic syndrome when you're trying to lose weight, what they found was that a higher intake of animal origin protein, specifically meat, is associated with higher plasma levels of inflammatory markers in obese adults. The reason obesity is associated with increased risk of many cancers may be because of obesity-associated inflammation. Obesity-driven inflammation may stimulate prostaglandin-mediated estrogen biosynthesis in breast tissues. That means the inflammation may activate the enzyme that allows breast tumors to make their own estrogen via this inflammatory compound called prostaglandin. If you measure the level of prostaglandins in women's urine, it correlates with breast cancer risk. And how do you get high levels of this inflammatory compound? Smoking, a high saturated fat diet, and obesity. Why does eating saturated fat lead to prostaglandin production? Because prostaglandins are made from arachidonic acid, and arachidonic acid is a major ingredient in animal fats. And so animal fats contain arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is what our body produces inflammatory compounds like prostaglandins with, and they can then go on to stimulate breast cancer growth, and may also play a role in colon cancer, lung cancer, or head and neck cancer as well. Whereas whole plant foods have anti-inflammatory effects, though some plants are better than others. Uh, the folks made to eat five a day of high antioxidant fruits and vegetables, like berries and greens, had a significantly better impact on reducing systemic inflammation and liver dysfunction compared to five a day of the more common low antioxidant fruits and veggies, like bananas and lettuce. High blood pressure is not the only harmful effect of too much salt. It's also been tied to stomach cancer, kidney stones, bone loss, obesity even, and direct damage to our kidneys, arteries, and heart. But as I've reviewed before, there's a consensus that dietary sodium plays a significant role in raising people's blood pressure, a dispute that has now finally been resolved. So there's this unequivocal evidence that increased sodium intake associated with increased blood pressure we know that increased blood pressure leads to increased risk of vascular diseases like strokes and aneurysms and atherosclerosis. So, to quote the longtime editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, we all must decrease our salt intake! Exclamation point. As certainly other authorities have echoed. So how is the food industry going to keep the salt controversy alive. If salt leads to high blood pressure, and high blood pressure to disease, if A leads to B and B leads to C, then A should lead to, lead to C. I mean, the logic seems sound. Blood pressure is one of the best validated surrogate markers for cardiovascular disease. And when countries have tried cutting down on salt, it seems to have worked. Campaigns in England were able to successfully bring down salt consumption, blood pressures dropped, and so did rates of heart disease and stroke. Now, they also, they also successfully brought down cholesterol levels and smoking, and improved fruit and vegetable consumption. Uh, but in Japan, they dropped salt intake while eating a worse diet and smoking more, and still saw a large reduction in stroke mortality. Based on what they were able to achieve in Finland, one daily teaspoon of salt may mean between 25 to 50% more deaths from heart attacks and strokes. Ah, but are there randomized controlled trials to show that? You know, they've never randomized people into two groups, one low sodium, one not, followed them out for 20 years to see if the differences in blood pressure translated into the expected consequences. But and for that matter, such a study has never been done on smoking either. Imagine randomizing a group of smokers to quit smoking or stay smoking for 10 years to see who gets lung cancer. 
Uh, first of all, it's hard to get people to quit, just like it's hard to keep people on a low-salt diet. And would it be ethical to force people to smoke for a decade, knowing from the totality of evidence that it's likely to hurt them? I mean, that's like the Tuskegee experiment. We can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, we're never going to get a decade-long randomized trial. But in 2007, we got this. Uh, there have been randomized trials of sodium reduction, uh, but they haven't lasted long enough to provide enough data on clinical outcomes. Uh, for example, the famous uh, TOHP trials, which randomized thousands into at least 18 months of salt reduction. Well, what if you followed up with them 10 to 15 years after the study was over, figuring, hey, maybe some of the low-salt groups stuck with it? And indeed, cut sodium intake by 25 to 35%, and we may end up with 25% lower risk of heart attacks and strokes and other cardiovascular events. This was considered the final nail in the coffin for salt. Right? Addressing the one remaining objection to universal salt reduction, the first study to show not only a reduction in blood pressure, but a reduction in hard endpoints, morbidity, mortality, by reducing dietary sodium intake. Case closed, 2007. But when billions of dollars are at stake, the case is never closed. One can just follow the press releases of the SALT Institute. For example, what about the Institute of Medicine report saying that sodium reduction may cause harm in certain patients with decompensated congestive heart failure? An analysis of those studies has since been retracted, out of concern that the data may have been falsified. Uh, but it's certainly possible that those with serious heart failure already severely SALT depleted by high-dose salt-wasting drugs may not benefit from further sodium reduction, uh, but for the great majority of the population, the message remains unchanged. What about the new study published in the American Journal of Hypertension that found the amount of salt we were eating is A-OK, -okay, suggesting a kind of U-shaped curve where too much sodium is bad, but too little could be bad too? But those biased less towards big salt and more towards big heart have noted that these studies have been widely misinterpreted, stirring unnecessary controversy and, and confusion. Basically, it comes down to three issues. Measurement error, confounding, and reverse causality. Uh, all this data came from studies that were not designed to assess the relationship, and so tended to use invalid sodium estimates, because that wasn't the point of the study. Uh, just because it's hard to do the multiple 24-hour urine collections necessary to get a really good measurement. And in the U.S., many of those eating less salt are not eating healthier. They're simply eating less food because maybe they're sick. So no wonder they'd have higher mortality rates. So, Compiling these studies together is kind of like a garbage in, garbage out. Uh, but why would they do that? I mean, they claim to have no conflicts of interest. But when confronted with evidence showing at least one of the co-authors received thousands of dollars from the SALT Institute, they reply that, well, they didn't get more than $5,000 from them in the last 12 months, so that's how they could get out of saying that they had any conflict of interest. If you instead look only at the trials in which they did the gold standard 24-hour collections in healthy people to avoid the reverse causation, and control for confounders, the curve instead looks like this. A continuous decrease in cardiovascular disease events like heart attacks and strokes as sodium levels, levels get lower and lower and lower. 17% increased risk of cardiovascular disease for every single gram of sodium a day. And this is for people without high blood pressure, for which we'd expect the benefit to be even greater. Unfortunately, the media had misly reported the findings, and a false sense of controversy from those other studies been broadcast, confusing the public, presumably exactly what the industry wants. Uh, but it's not just the media. When editorials are published on the subject, in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, you don't expect them to be written by those who got paid personal fees by Big Salt. And before accepting money 
from the Salt Institute, she was accepting money from the Tobacco Institute, and was a frequent expert witness in defense of Philip Morris and other tobacco companies. So if that's who the New England Journal of Medicine chooses to editorialize about salt, you can see the extent of industry influence. The editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Hypertension himself worked for many years as a consultant to the Salt Institute. Colic affects up to 40% of young infants characterized by prolonged periods of inconsolable crying. The condition is often dismissed as trivial by the medical profession, but should be treated seriously. It can contribute to postpartum depression, interfere with breastfeeding, and even lead to the death of the infant at the hands of a parent from shaken baby syndrome. They're not just crybabies. Colic is pain. The medical profession has a scandalous history, not just denying pain relief to infants, but routinely performing surgery on infants with minimal or no anesthesia into the 1980s. One famous case in 1985 was little Jeffrey Lawson, who underwent open-heart surgery fully awake and conscious. They just gave him a drug to paralyze him so he wouldn't squirm, but like a horror movie, he couldn't move, but could feel everything. This wasn't some rogue surgeon. Torturing babies was standard operating procedure in the 80s. Not the 1880s, mind you, the 1980s. The liaison between the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Society of Anesthesiologists commented that the use of paralyzing agents was a standard and time-honored technique. The profession has a history of infant pain denial. They didn't think babies could feel pain. Even today, most physicians don't use painkillers or even local anesthesia for circumcisions, for example. A procedure so traumatic that babies show stronger pain responses to vaccinations even months later. The pain of colic is thought to be caused by gastrointestinal discomfort, like intestinal cramping. In my videos on irritable bowel and relaxing the colon before a colonoscopy, I explored the role of peppermint oil in reducing intestinal spasm. So might it help with colic? A few drops of a peppermint leaf solution appeared to cut the number of colicky ep episodes in half and reduce daily crying from three hours to two hours, working just as well as the leading over-the-counter drug for colic called simethicone. Uh, the problem is that simethicone has been shown to have no benefit for colic, so saying peppermint is as good as useless isn't exactly a ringing endorsement. And the American Academy of Pediatrics warns about the use of peppermint oil in infants. One study found an herbal tea preparation to be helpful, but parents have been cautioned not to use them, not only because tea may interfere with breastfeeding continuity, but the lack of adequate industry regulation. For example, star anise tea is commonly used for colic. Chinese star anise is regarded as safe and non-toxic, but Japanese star anise is poisonous. They look identical, but Japanese star anise contains a potent neurotoxin, and it's been found contaminating star anise tea in the U.S., and so we shouldn't give it to kids. Uh, there's even a report of toxicity from a supposed homeopathic dose of belladonna, also known as deadly nightshade, that evidently wasn't homeopathic enough. And then another. Just because it's homeopathic doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Uh, it's no better when doctors prescribe it, though. Uh, the drugs used for colic are made from belladonna, too. The drugs may work, but should not be used because of their serious side effects. What about just good old-fashioned burping? Burping after feeding is, after all, commonly advised by pediatricians, nurses, parenting, websites to promote expulsion of gases that accumulate during feeding with the aim of decreasing discomfort and crying episodes. But scientific evidence for the efficacy of burping is lacking until 
This 2014 randomized controlled trial for the prevention of colic and regurgitation, also known as spitting up, in healthy infants. So what did they find? Useless for colic, and made the regurgitation worse. Burped babies spit up twice as many times as unburped babies. So what's an effective treatment? The elimination of cow's milk protein, thinking colic may be some sort of allergic response. Decades ago, it was shown that infants fed cow's milk developed antibody responses to the bovine proteins, which may explain why colic can improve after changing from a cow's milk formula to either a hypoallergenic hydrolyzed protein formula or a soy-based formula. Now, breastfed infants have similar rates of colic as formula-fed infants, but that might be because breast milk from milk-drinking mothers contains cow's milk proteins. We know cow's milk proteins can pass through breast milk and cause certain serious allergic reactions, but what about colic? Based on studies of formula-fed infants, colic was already a well-known symptom of intolerance to cow's milk protein back in the 70s. So thinking colic in breastfed infants may be caused by cow's milk proteins transmitted from mother to infant via breast milk, they tried a dairy-free diet for breastfeeding mothers whose infants had colic. Of 19 infants, the colic disappeared promptly from 13, and in 12 of those 13 they were able to show that they could bring back the colic by challenging the mothers with a little dairy. For example, a baby boy develops colic that almost completely disappears within a day of mom eliminating cow's milk, and then promptly comes back when mom went back on dairy. The researchers conclude that the treatment for infantile colic in breastfed infants is a diet free of cow's milk for the mother, a recommendation that continues to this day. What we eat, or don't eat, can affect our immune system. Uh, this study was conducted to determine the effect of the consumption of brightly colored vegetables on the immune system. The first two weeks, basically no fruits and veggies. Then two weeks drinking a cup and a half of tomato juice every day. Then carrot juice. Then spinach powder. This is a graph of a marker of immune function over those eight weeks. Within just two weeks of a fruit and veggie deficient diet, immune function plummets. But just a cup and a half of tomato juice and can bring us back from the ashes. Not five servings a day, just that one tall glass of tomato juice. But the carrot juice alone didn't seem to help as well, nor did the powder equivalent of about one serving of spinach. This says to me two things. One, how remarkably we can affect our immune function with simple dietary decisions. And two, not all veggies are alike. Though this study was repeated looking at other immune markers, and the tomato versus carrot appeared more evenly matched, there is one family of vegetables we definitely don't want to miss out on. Inflammation. Leaky gut, all because of an absence of AHR ligands. In other words, an absence of cruciferous vegetables in our diet. Cabbage, collards, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. So, do people who eat healthier actually get sick less? Those who eat more fruits and vegetables appear to have a lower risk of getting an upper respiratory tract infection like the common cold, whether they're otherwise vegetarian or not. Even just one added apple a day may help keep the doctor away. Uh, the common cold is so innocuous, though. Why not test against something stronger? One can also look at more serious respiratory infections like influenza looking at the relationship between various risk factors and influenza-related hospitalizations in the United States, they found that a 5% increase in the prevalence of obesity was bad, associated with 6% increased hospitalization rate, but physical inactivity was worse, 7%. But just that tiny bump in the rates of low fruit and vegetable consumption may increase, increase flu-related hospitalization rates even more. And the common cold isn't always innocuous. A common cold during the first trimester of pregnancy is associated with a number of birth defects, including one of the worst, 
um, anencephaly, a fatal malformation of the brain. Uh, more recent data suggests it's the fever, as anti-fever drugs appeared able to prevent the possible birth defect causing effect of the common cold. But even better, to not get sick in the first place. A thousand women and their diets were followed before and during pregnancy, and women who consumed more fruits and vegetables had a moderate reduction in risk of upper respiratory tract infection during pregnancy, and this benefit appears to be derived from both fruits and vegetables instead of either alone. Whole fruits and vegetables provide a natural balance of all sorts of things that may improve our immune function in a complementary, combined, or synergistic manner that could account for the protective effect observed from high consumption of both fruits and vegetables. Or maybe that's the only way they got enough. Uh, the women who appeared protected in this study were eating nearly nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, compared with only five servings of fruits, or four of veggies. Uh, that may fulfill some arbitrary five or six a day minimum, but may be insufficient for effective immunity. Uh, for example, in that famous study I profiled previously, elderly individuals randomized into a five-a-day group did have an improved antibody response to their pneumonia vaccination, compared to just two servings of fruits and veggies a day, an 80% increase. But only 30% reached their target levels, 12 out of 40 six times better than the two-a-day group, but maybe eight, nine, or ten a day would have worked even better. In the U.S., we tend to get less than 20 grams of fiber a day, only about half the minimum recommended intake. But in populations where many of our deadliest diseases are practically unknown, rural China, rural Africa, they're eating huge amounts of whole plant foods, up to 100 grams of fiber a day or more, which is what it's estimated our Paleolithic ancestors were getting based on dietary analyses of modern-day primitive hunter-gatherer tribes and by analyzing coprolites, human fossilized feces. In other words, paleopoop these most intimate of ancient human artifacts were often ignored or discarded during many previous archaeological excavations, but careful study of materials painstakingly recovered from human paleofeces says a lot about what ancient human dietary practices were like given their incredibly high content of fiber, undigested plant remains, strongly suggesting that for over 99% of our existence as a distinct species, our gastrointestinal tract has been exposed to the selective pressures exerted by a fiber-filled diet of whole plant foods. Uh, so for millions of years before the first stone tools and evidence of butchering our ancestors were eating plants. But what kind of plants? One way you can tell if animals are natural folivores or frugivores, uh, meaning leaf eaters or fruit eaters, is to map the area of absorptive mucosa in our gut versus their functional body size. Folivores are those meant to eat mostly foliage, leaves, while frugivores are better designed to eat fruit. The faunivores eat the fauna, another name for carnivore. If you chart animals out this way, they fall along distinct lines. So where do humans land? Here's our functional body size, and here's our absorptive area. So while eating our greens is important, it appears the natural dietary status of the human species is primarily that of a fruit eater. Why does it matter how much fiber we used to eat? Well, one theory for the rising levels of obesity in Western populations is that the body's mechanisms for controlling appetite evolved to match how many plants we used to eat. Our ancestors ate so many plant foods, we were getting like 100 grams of fiber a day. So for millions of years, food equaled fiber. So uh, no surprise, one of the physiological mechanisms our body evolved to suppress our appetite involved this fiber. For example, 
Fiber is metabolized by our gut flora into short-chain fatty acids, which bind to and activate receptors on the surface of our cells that alter our metabolism. For example, activating receptors on fat cells to increase the expression of the weight-reducing hormone leptin. Other hormones are affected as well. Uh, since until recently, food meant fiber. An increase in food intake meant an increase in fiber intake, which made our gut bacteria so happy they made lots of short-chain fatty acids, activating the cell surface receptors, releasing a bunch of hormones that make us lose our appetite and downregulate hunger, so we eat less. But if we eat less, there's less fiber in our gut, so less of these hormones are released, which boosts our appetite. We get hungry, and we want to eat. But what if food doesn't equal fiber, like on the standard American diet? Then we keep just getting those signals to eat, eat, eat. We're always hungry. If we haven't eaten our 100 grams of fiber for the day, our body may be like, what, are we starving here? Discovering this mechanism makes the food and pharmaceutical industries very excited. They figure they can now come up with you know, the new drugs in the fight against the current obesity onslaught, or we could just eat as nature intended. More than 60 years ago, the World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, just because you're not depressed doesn't necessarily mean you're happy. Uh, but if you look at the medical literature, there are 20 times more study published on health and depression than there are on health and happiness. In recent years, though, research on positive psychology has emerged what we can do to increase our success, functioning, and happiness, all inherently good in themselves, but are happier people healthier people? There's growing evidence that positive psychological well-being is associated with reduced risk of physical illness. Uh, but it's not surprising that healthier people are happier than sick people. The intriguing issue is whether psychological well-being protects against future illness or inhibits the progression of chronic disease. To figure out which came first, you'd have to get more than just a snapshot in time. You'd need prospective studies, meaning studies that go forward in time to see if people start out happier do indeed live longer. And yes, a review of such studies suggests that positive psychological well-being has a favorable effect on survival in both healthy and diseased populations. But not so fast. Yes. Positive states may be associated with less stress and inflammation and more resilience to infection, but uh, positive well-being may also be accompanied by a healthy lifestyle that itself reduces the risk of disease. Uh, happy people tend to smoke less, exercise more, drink less, and sleep better. So maybe happiness leads to health only indirectly. However, the apparent protective effect of positive psychological well-being persisted even after controlling for all these healthy behaviors, meaning effectively, even at the same level of smoking, drinking, exercise, and sleep, happier people did seem to live longer. Ideally, to definitively establish cause and effect, we do an interventional trial in which participants are assigned at random to different mood levels and tracked for health outcomes. It's rarely feasible or ethical to randomly make some people's lives miserable to see what happens, but if you pay people enough, you can do experiments like this. It's been thought that people who typically ex report experiencing negative emotions are at greater risk for disease, and those who typically report positive emotions are at less risk, so they decided to test this using the common cold virus. 334 healthy volunteers were assessed for how happy, pleased, and relaxed they were, or how anxious, hostile, and depressed. Subsequently, they were given nasal drops containing cold rhinoviruses to see who would be more likely to come down with a cold. Who would let someone drip viruses in their nose? Someone paid $800, that's who. Okay. 
Now, just because you get exposed to a cold virus doesn't mean you automatically get sick, because you have an immune system that can fight it off, even if it's dripped right into your nose. The question is whose immune system fights better? In a third of the bummed out folks, their immune systems failed to fight off the virus and they came down with a cold. But only about one in five got a cold in the happy group. Maybe it's because those with positive emotions slept better, more exercise, lower stress? No. It appears even after controlling for the healthy practices and levels of stress hormones, happier people still appear to have healthier immune systems, a greater resistance to developing the common cold. Works with the flu, too. They repeated the study with the flu virus. And like in the earlier study, increased positive emotions was associated with decreased verified illness rates. These results indicate that feeling vigorous, calm, and happy may play a more important role in health than previously thought. Thousands of papers have been published on the important topic of what determines people's happiness and psychological health. But what about the potential influence of the different kinds of foods that people eat? The rising prevalence of mental ill health is causing a considerable burden, and so inexpensive and effective strategies are required to improve the psychological well-being of our population. And now, we have a growing body of literature suggesting that dietary intake may have the potential to influence psychological well-being. Dietary intake of what? Well, given the strong evidence base for the health benefits of fruits and vegetables, researchers started there. Cross-sectional studies from all over the world support this relationship between happiness and fruit and vegetable intake. Those eating fruits and vegetables each day at a higher likelihood of being classified as very happy, suggesting a strong and positive correlation between fruit and vegetable consumption and happiness, perhaps feelings of optimism too. The largest such study was done in Great Britain, where a dose-response relationship was found between daily servings of fruits and vegetables and both life satisfaction and happiness, meaning more fruits and veggies meant more happiness. People who got up to seven or eight servings a day reported the highest life satisfaction and happiness. And these associations remain significant even after controlling for factors such as income and illness and exercise, smoking and body weight, suggesting fruit and vegetable consumption wasn't just acting as a marker for other healthy behaviors. But how could eating plants improve happiness on their own? Well, Many fruits and veggies contain higher levels of vitamin C, which is a cofactor in the production of dopamine, the zest-for-life neurotransmitter. And the antioxidants reduce inflammation, which may lead to higher levels of eudaimonic well-being. Aristotle's notion of eudaimonia, described as the highest of all human goods, the realization of one's true potential which was the aim of this study. They wanted to know whether eating fruits and vegetables was associated with other markers of well-being beyond happiness and life satisfaction, like greater eudaimonic well-being, a state of flourishing uh, characterized by feelings of engagement, meaning, and purpose in life. So a sample of about 400 adult, young adults followed for about two weeks, and indeed young adults who ate more fruits and veggies reported higher average eudaimonic well-being, more intense feelings of curiosity, greater creativity. And they could follow this on a day-by-day -day basis, greater well-being on the days they ate healthier. These findings suggest that fruit and vegetable intake is related to other aspects of human flourishing beyond just feeling happy. Not so fast, though. Instead of eating good food, food leading to a good mood, maybe the good mood led to eating good food. Experimentally, if you put people in a good mood, they rate healthy foods like apples higher than indulgent foods like candy bars. Given a choice between M&Ms and grapes, individuals in a positive mood were more likely to choose the grapes. The results of these studies lend support to a growing body of research that suggests that positive mood facilitates resistance to temptation. Uh, who needs comfort foods when you're already comforted? It's like which came first, the stricken or the egg? 
Yes, eating eggs may increase our likelihood of chronic disease, but maybe chronic disease also increases our likelihood of eating unhealthy foods. Which came first, the mood or the food? What we need is a study like this, but instead of looking at well-being and diet on the same day, you see if there's a correlation between what you eat today and how you feel tomorrow. Uh, but we didn't have a study like that until now. They found the same strong relationships between daily positive mood and fruit and vegetable consumption, but lagged analyses showed that fruit and vegetable consumption predicted improvements in positive mood the next day, not vice versa. On days when people ate more fruits and vegetables, they reported feeling calmer, happier, more energetic than they normally do, and they also felt more positive the next day. So eating fruits and vegetables really may promote emotional well-being. Uh, look, single bouts of exercise can elevate one's mood. Why not the same thing with healthy food? How many fruits and vegetables? Seems we need to consume approximately 7.2 daily servings of fruit or 8.2 servings of vegetables to notice a meaningful change. Over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates described gout as a disease of kings, primarily because it was the wealthy who could afford the rich foods which seemed to precipitate gouty attacks. But now we can all eat like kings and acquire some diseases of royalty ourselves. Gout is caused by needle-sharp crystals of uric acid in our joints, and uric acid comes from the breakdown of purines, and purines are the breakdown product of genetic material, DNA, the foundation of all life. So there's no such thing as a purine-free diet, but foods do vary in their purine content. And it was long thought that people with gout just needed to stay away from all high purine foods, whether they're from animals like organ meats or plants like beans. Uh, but this strategy proved ineffective. Yes, all uric acid comes from the breakdown of purines, so limiting meat makes sense, but that means all kinds of meat and plant sources have now been largely exonerated. The association of gout with, more, with both alcohol intake and increased dietary purine consumption has been known since ancient times, but there were no prospective trials to back it up until just a decade ago. The Harvard Health Professionals follow-up study of about 50,000 men followed for a dozen years, and alcohol intake strongly associated increased risk of gout. In terms of food, they found increased risk of gout with higher meat and fish consumption, but not with higher consumption of purine-rich plant foods. Uh, maybe because the purines in plants are less bioavailable? Um, so though it's been suggested that gout sufferers should moderate both purine-rich animal and plant foods, the results suggest that this type of dietary restriction may be only applicable to purines of animal origin. Although it was not surprising that meat and seafood had significant associations with the incidence of gout, this lack of effect of purine-rich plant foods was new. Uh, there don't appear to be any long-term studies showing purine-rich foods, plant, plant foods, increase risk, uh, though there are still some guidelines out there continuing to disseminate these outdated recommendations. Not only has the intake of purine-rich plants not been associated with high uric acid levels, but the vegetables that gout sufferers are specifically told to stay away from, mushrooms, peas, beans, lentils, cauliflower, were actually found to be protective. This may be because foods rich in fiber, folate, and vitamin C appear to protect against uric acid buildup in gout. For example, fiber has been recognized as having a potential role in binding uric acid in the gut for excretion. Lack of association between purine-rich vegetables and urea could be due to the co-packaging of these beneficial plant components— vitamin C, uh, dietary fibers, and phytochemicals— which may mediate the effect of purines on uric acid. Vegetable intake, regardless of purine content, may also be protective in terms of getting rid of uric acid via excretion. By changing the pH of our urine, we can change uric acid clearance. Eating an alkaline diet, a vegetarian diet in this case, uh, was found effective for removing uric acid from the body. Those eating the alkaline diet excreted significantly more uric acid than those eating the acidic diet. 
As such, uric acid levels in the blood of those eating the acid-forming diet rose within days. So one would assume uric acid levels are lower in vegetarians, and indeed those eating vegetarian long-term found to have significantly lower levels in their blood. Uh, to prove cause and effect, though, you need to do an interventional trial where you take people, change their diet, see what happens. So they took 10 guys for a study of the buildup of uric acid in the kidneys, uh, kept them on a standard Western diet for five days, and measured their relative supersaturation for uric acid. Then they tried a vegetarian diet for five days and got this. The intake of the vegetarian diet led to a 93% decline in the risk of uric acid crystallization within days. Or you could do it the other way. Take a bunch of people with gout, feed them a big meal of meat, and see if you can trigger an attack. Seven patients were put in a hospital, stabilized on a low purine diet, and then challenged with a meat-laden dinner. In response, Uric acid levels shot up, and they started getting gout attacks. Then they added alcohol, and uric acid levels shot up even further. In all, just with single meals, they were able to trigger gout attacks in six out of the seven patients. Now, some meat has less purines than others. Superworms have particularly low purine levels. Super, because they're like two to three inches long. Not all animal foods increase gout risk, though low-fat dairy products were found to be protective. If that's the case, we would predict vegans could, would be at a disadvantage, which, which is indeed what was found, uh, though these were all within the normal range, which is uh, like uh, 3.5 to 7. Should gout patients add milk to their diets? Well, although drinking the equivalent of 10 cups of skin milk at a time appears to have an acute lowering effect on uric acid levels, in the long term, over months, at the equivalent of 2 cups a day, uh, there was not a statistically significant lowering effect. Uh, they gave skim milk powder to gout patients for three months, and it did not appear to help. Uh, though soy milk has also been associated with a lower risk of uh, uric acid buildup, there are no interventional trials to back that up. The bottom line is that we now have good research on how to reduce the risk of gout without the use of drug treatments through modification of diet. And that's important because allopurinol is the drug of choice. It's considered generally safe, but what does it mean when doctors talk about a relatively safe drug? Well, about 2% of patients develop hypersensitivity reactions, which can sometimes be severe, and fatal, with a mortality rate of up to 20%. And that's the safe drug. The other leading drug, colchicine, has no clear-cut distinction between the non-toxic, toxic, and lethal dose. Dozens of studies now suggest that the nitrates in vegetables, such as beets and green leafy vegetables, may help both sick people as a low-cost prevention and treatment intervention for patients suffering from blood flow disorders, such as high blood pressure and peripheral vascular disease, as well as healthy people, as an effective natural performance-enhancing aid for athletes. Most of the studies were done on beet juice, which is why I was so delighted to see the study on whole beets, as I reported before, showing the same benefit. But what about studies on whole green leafy vegetables? There was this study a while ago suggesting that one of the reasons that at the age many Americans and Europeans are dying, the Okinawan Japanese are looking forward to many more years of good health, or at least they were, is all the nitrate in their green leafy vegetables, which tended to bring down blood pressures when put to the test. And the reason I didn't report on it at the time is because I never heard of these vegetables. Uh, I know what chrysanthemum flowers are, but I didn't think most of my viewers would be able to find these at the local store. What about good old American red, white, and blue greens, like frozen spinach? Hadn't been tested until now. They wanted to test the immediate effects on our arteries of a single meal containing a cooked box of frozen spinach for both arterial stiffness and blood pressure. First, they needed a meal to increase artery stiffness and pressure, so they gave people a chicken and cheese sandwich 
which lowered the elasticity of their arteries within hours of eating, but add the spinach, and the opposite happens. After chicken and cheese, the force the heart has to pump goes up within minutes, but the spinach keeps things level. So, a meal with lots of spinach can lower blood pressure and improve measures of arterial stiffness. That's great for day-to-day -day, you know, cardiovascular health, but what if you want a whole food source that can improve your performance when you're out hiking or something? Beets and spinach aren't the most convenient of foods. Is there anything we can just add to our trail mix? Well, if you look at the list of high nitrate vegetables, you'll see there isn't much you can just stick in your pocket unless fennel seeds have a lot, which are actually not seeds at all, but the whole little fruits of the fennel plant. Let's find out. Fennel seeds are often used as mouth fresheners after a meal in both the Indian subcontinent and around the world. You'll typically see a bowl of candy-coated fennel seeds as you walk out of Indian restaurants. And when you chew fennel seeds, you can get a significant bump in nitric oxide production, which has the predictable vasodilatory effect of opening up blood vessels, making them a cheap, easy way to carry a lightweight, non-perishable source of nitrates. Uh, they single out mountaineers, thinking chewing fennel seeds could help maintain oxygen levels at high altitudes and help prevent HAPE, high-altitude pulmonary edema, one of the leading killers of mountain climbers once you get more than like a mile and a half above sea level. Not to be confused with HAFE, caused by the expansion of gas at high altitudes, a condition known as high-altitude flatus expulsion, known to veteran backpackers as Rocky Mountain barking spiders. But fennel seeds may help with that too, as traditionally they've been used as a carminative, meaning a remedy for intestinal gas. Fennel has also been shown anti-hirsutism uh, activity, uh, combating excessive hair growth in women, the so-called uh, bearded woman uh, syndrome, but applying a little fennel seed cream can significantly reduce it. But if fennel seeds have such a strong hormonal effect, should we be worried about chewing them? Well, there have been cases reported of premature breast development among young girls uh, drinking fennel seed tea a couple times a day for several months. Their estrogen levels were ele elevated, but after stopping the tea, their chests and hormone levels went back to normal. Current guidelines recommend against prolonged use in vulnerable groups, so children under 12, pregnant and breastfeeding women, and perhaps your pet rat, as rodents metabolize a compound in fennel called uh, uh, estragol into a carcinogen, but our cells appear able to detoxify it. Ruin why gastric bypass surgery is one of the most successful treatment strategies for diabetes accompanying morbid obesity. Long-term diabetes remission rates of 83% have been reported. These findings have led to the suggestion that the surgery improves diabetes by somehow altering digestive hormones, but this interpretation ignores the fact that they're placed on a severely limited diet for a week or two after the operation just to recover from the major surgery. And just severe caloric restriction alone can improve diabetes. So is it the diet? or the surgery. We didn't know until this study. They put diabetics in the exact same post-surgery diet, with and without the actual surgery. They found that their diabetes improved rapidly on the surgery diet before they had the surgery. In fact, the improvement in blood sugar control was better on the diet alone than after the surgery. Blood sugar control improved better in the absence of surgery, suggesting the whole surgical diabetes reversal is not due to the surgery at all, but just the diet people had to go on in the hospital during recovery. So the clinical implication is that non-surgical interventions have the potential to resolve diabetes just as much as major organ rearranging surgery. 
If you remember my video about diabetes as a disease of fat toxicity, you'll understand what is occurring. Type 2 diabetes can be understood as, it, uh, as a potentially reversible metabolic state precipitated by the single cause of chronic excess intra-organ fat, too much fat in the cells of the liver, pancreas, and muscles. Within seven days of eating like 600 calories a day, by either dietary intervention or bariatric surgery, fasting glucose levels can normalize, blood sugars can normalize, thanks to a fall in liver fat. Here's a CT scan showing a 35% reduction in liver volume as all the fat is cleared out. Unbelievable. And then the body starts pulling fat out of the pancreas, and when the cause of diabetes goes away, the diabetes goes away the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas had woken up. Clearly, the beta cells are not permanently damaged in type 2 diabetes, but are merely inhibited. They report reversal of diabetes up to 28 years after diagnosis. So diabetics motivated enough to starve themselves can regain normal health. Uh, this information should be available to all people with type 2 diabetes, even though it's you know, unlikely many will be motivated enough to escape from the disease, and it's not easy to not eat. Diabetics should know that if they don't reverse their diabetes, their future health is in jeopardy, although the serious consequences must be balanced against the difficulties and privations associated with starvation diets. Uh, for many people, this may prove too high a price to pay. I mean, it's hard to voluntary rest voluntarily restrict food intake that much. OK, how about involuntary food restriction? That's what stomach stapling surgery is. When you essentially remove someone's stomach, they're forced into compulsory food restriction. Of course, major surgery carries major risks. Both during the operation and afterwards, there can be bleeding, leakage, infections, erosions, herniations, severe nutritional deficiencies. Surgery or starvation? There's got to be a better way. And in fact, there is. Instead of changing the quantity of food eaten, either voluntarily or involuntarily, is it possible to reverse diabetes by changing the quality of the food? We've known type 2 diabetes could be reversed by an extreme reduction in food intake for nearly a century and a half since the 1870 siege of Paris during the Franco-Prussian War. This has been demonstrated experimentally by starving people enough you can reverse diabetes. Diabetes specialists have long known that the tiny proportion of iron-willed diabetics who can substantially decrease their weight and maintain this can exhibit a return to normal metabolism. A label is required to allow doctors to recognize and appropriately manage this subgroup who are willing to do anything to get rid of their diabetes. These are the health-motivated. At the time of diagnosis, the health-motivated individuals will benefit from being advised that they are likely to be able to reverse their diabetes completely by losing up to a fifth of their body weight. And then, and only then, if they've shown to not be sufficiently strongly motivated, should the routine guidelines for managing type 2 diabetes be rolled out, which include lots of drugs. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the control of blood sugar with medication has proven to be unsustainable, and may actually exacerbate obesity, and make us put on more weight, creating a vicious cycle. There's got to be a better way. Instead of starving oneself by eating less food, what if instead we just ate better food? A diet that emphasizes all-you-can-eat greens, lots of vegetables, beans, some whole grains, nuts and seeds, at least 90% plant-based, so at least one big salad every day, like a pound of raw greens, veggie bean soup, a handful of nuts and seeds, fruit at every meal, a pound of cooked greens, some whole grains, no refined grains, junk food or oil, and a restriction on animal products. 13 diabetic men and women sticking to this diet for an average of seven months. How did they do? 
Hemoglobin A1c is considered the best measure of blood sugar control. Below 6 is normal, non-diabetic. But the official American Diabetes Association target is to just get diabetics at least down to 7 and anything above 7 is uncontrolled diabetes. Here's where they all started out after having diabetes for an average of more than 7 years. Then they start plowing in the plants. Month 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. After about 7 months, their average A1c dropped from a diabetic 8.2 down to a non-diabetic 5.8. The majority drop down to normal, and this is after dropping most of their medication. Now, this was a pilot study, just a handful of people, no control group, and included only people who could actually stick to the diet, a retrospective case series considered one of the weakest forms of published evidence. However, the magnitude of the effect they found indicates a high-nutrient-density diet can be very effective for some people. Diabetes reversal should be a goal in the management of type 2 diabetes, not just treatment. Type 2 diabetes can be re reversed with an extremely low-calorie diet. Type 2 diabetes can be reversed with an extremely healthy diet. But is that because it's also low in calories? The study subjects lost as much weight on the green leafy vegetable-packed plant-based diet as this semi-starvation diet based on liquid meal replacements. Um, so it doesn't matter what you're eating, as long as you're eating few enough calories to lose 15 pounds a month. Well, even if diabetes reversal was just about calorie restriction, instead of subsisting off largely sugar, powdered milk, corn syrup, and oil, on a plant-based diet at least you can eat food, real food, in fact pounds of food a day, as many low-cal veggies as you can stuff in your face. Uh, so even if it only worked because it's just another type of calorie-restricted diet, certainly a healthier version, but even participants who did not lose weight, or even gained weight eating enormous quantities of whole healthy plant foods, appeared to improve their diabetes. Thus the beneficial effects of this kind of diet appear to extend beyond just the weight loss. The successful treatment of type 2 diabetes with a plant-based diet goes back to the 1930s providing incontestable evidence that a diet centered around vegetables, fruits, grains, and beans was more effective in controlling diabetes than any other dietary treatment. Randomized controlled trial. Insulin needs were cut in half. A quarter ended off of, uh, off of insulin altogether, but again, this was a low-calorie diet. Uh, Kempner at Duke reported similar results 20 years later with his rice and fruit diet for the first time, showing documented reversal of diabetic retinopathy in a quarter of his patients, something never even thought possible. For example, a 60-year-old diabetic woman, already blind in one eye, can only see contours of large objects with the other. Five years later on the diet, instead of it getting worse, it got better. She, now she can make out faces, see signs, large newspaper print, in addition to being off insulin with normal blood sugars and a 100-point drop in her cholesterol. Or from just being able to read big headlines in another patient to being able to read newsprint four months later. What was behind these remarkable reversals? Was it because the diet was extremely low fat, or was it because there was no animal protein and no animal fat, or was it because the diet was so restrictive and monotonous that the patients lost weight and improved their diabetes that way? So to tease this out, what we would need is a study where they switch people to a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much that they wouldn't lose any weight. Then we could see if a plant-based diet had benefits independent of all the weight loss. For that, we'd have to wait another 20 years, but here it is. Diets were designed to be weight-maintaining. So the subjects were weighed every day. If they started losing weight, they were made to eat more food. In fact, so much food, some of the participants had trouble eating it all. Right? They're like, ah, not another salad. Uh, but they eventually adapted, so there was no significant alterations in body weight despite restrictions of meat, dairy, and eggs and enough whole plant foods, whole grains, beans, vegetables, and fruit, to provide 65 grams of fiber a day. That's four times what the standard American diet provides. The control diet they used was the conventional diabetic diet, which actually had nearly twice the fiber content of the standard American diet, so it was probably healthier than what these people were used to eating. Okay, so how'd they do? 
with zero weight loss, did the dietary intervention still help? Here's the before and after insulin requirements of the 20 people they put on the diet. This is the number of units of insulin they had to inject themselves with before and after going on the plant-based diet. Overall, insulin requirements were cut about 60%. Half were able to get off insulin altogether, despite no change in weight. So uh, was this after five years or seven months, like in the other studies I showed? No, 16 days. So we're talking diabetics who've had diabetes as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then as few as 13 days later, they're off insulin altogether, thanks to less than two weeks on a plant-based diet. Patient 15, 32 units of insulin on the control diet, and then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. And as a bonus, their cholesterol dropped like a rock in 16 days. You just like moderate changes in diet, usually result in only modest reductions in cholesterol, asking people with diabetes to make moderate changes often achieves equally moderate results, which is one possible reason why most end up on drugs, injections, or both. Everything in moderation may be a truer statement than people realize. Moderate changes in diet can leave one with moderate blindness, moderate kidney failure, moderate amputations, maybe just a couple toes. Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. The more we ask as physicians from our patients, the more we get. You know, the old adage, you know, shoot for the moon, seems to apply. It may be more effective than limiting patients to small steps that may sound more manageable, but are not sufficient to actually stop the disease. According to two of perhaps the most credible nutrition authorities, the World Health Organization and the European Food Safety Authority, we should get at least a half a percent of our calories from the essential short-chain omega-3 ALA, which is easy, just like a tablespoon a day of chia seeds or ground flax seeds, and you're all set. Our body can then take the short-chain ALA from our diet and elongate it into the long-chain omega-3s, EPA and DHA. But the question has long been, can our bodies make enough for optimal health? Well, how would you determine that? Well, take fiber, for example. A convincing body of literature showed an increased heart disease risk when diets were low in fiber. So the Institute of Medicine came up with a recommendation for about 30 grams a day, which is an intake observed to protect against coronary heart disease and reduce constipation. Thus, just as cardiovascular disease was used to help establish an adequate intake for dietary fiber, it was used as a way to develop a recommendation for EPA and DHA. So with reviews published as late as 2009 suggesting fish oil capsules may help with heart disease, nutrition authorities recommended an additional 250 mg a day of preformed EPA and DHA, since evidently we were not making enough on our own if taking more helped. So in addition to the 1 or 2 grams of ALA, 250 mg of preformed DHA EPA, which can be gotten from fish or algae. Uh, fish is a toughie, because on one hand, fish has the preformed DHA and EPA, but on the other hand, our oceans have become so polluted that fish may contain various pollutants, including dioxins, PCBs, pesticides like DDT, flame retardant chemicals, and heavy metals, including mercury, lead, and cadmium, that can negatively affect human health. Uh, this was an editorial comment on a recent study on women that found that dietary exposure to PCBs was associated with increased risk of stroke, and almost three times higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. Unless you live next to a toxic waste dump, the main source of exposure to PCBs is fish consumption, of which uh, perhaps salmon is the worst, uh, though PCBs can also be found in lesser quantities in other meat sources as well. Uh, this may explain why studies in the U.S. have shown that 
just a single serving of fish a week may significantly increase one's risk of diabetes, emphasizing that even levels of these pollutants once considered safe may completely counteract the potential benefits of the omega-3s and other nutrients present in fish, leading to the type of metabolic disturbances that often precede type 2 diabetes. Now one could get their 250 mg a day from algae oil rather than fish oil, which is free from toxic contaminants because it never comes in contact with anything from the ocean. Uh, then one could get the best of both worlds, right? the beneficial nutrients without the harmful contaminants. But recently it was demonstrated that these long-chain omega-3s don't seem to help with preventing or treating heart disease after all. And since that's the main reason we thought people should get that extra 250 mg of preformed EPA and DHA, why do I still recommend following the guidelines? Because the recommendations were not just based on heart health, but brain health as well. As we age, our arteries stiffen. These are measurements of the stiffness of our aorta, the main artery coming off the heart, as we get older and older. As our aorta stiffens, it leads to a range of pathological changes, such as exposing our brain and kidneys to greater pressure fluctuations, which may increase the risk of stroke and impairment of kidney function. Those who consume garlic, though, just less than a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day, appear to have less stiffness in their aortas. Uh, we think this is because garlic seems to improve the function of the inner lining of our arteries, which helps our arteries relax. Uh, but the protective mechanisms of garlic against cardiovascular diseases are multiple, and include a combination of anti-clotting, clot-busting, antioxidant, and blood pressure and cholesterol-lowering effects. The latest review suggests a long-term garlic intake may drop bad cholesterol levels about 10%. But the blood thinning effects are such that the American Society of Anesthesiology recommends garlic intake be stopped a week before elective surgery. Or, presumably, you could just cook it to death. Unlike the anti-clotting components concentrated in the yellow fluid around tomato seeds, which are heat-stable, the antiplatelet activity in garlic and onions is lost with cooking. Here's the platelet inhibition of raw garlic compared to boiled garlic, which was right down around raw onion. Uh, so garlic appears about, to be about 13 times more potent than onion, and eating garlic raw appears to be better than cooked, suggesting that garlic and onions could be more potent inhibitors of blood clotting if consumed in raw rather than cooked or boiled form. So right before surgery it might be good to cook garlic, but what about the rest of the time when we're trying to suppress platelet overactivity to decrease the risk of heart attacks and stroke? As garlic and onion are normally consumed in cooked form, their efficacy as preventive herbs and cardiovascular disease may be in doubt. But uh, look, we can put the raw onion on our salads, or put raw garlic in salsa, or dressings, or dips, or pesto. Or we can crush or chop it, wait 10 minutes, and then cook it. Here's the platelet-inhibiting power of raw garlic. And if you cook it just a few minutes, it does fine. But after like five minutes, the benefit is abolished. But if you pre-crush and wait, some of the antiplatelet activity is retained a bit longer. That's because the enzyme that makes the antiplatelet compounds is activated by crushing, but destroyed by heat faster than the compounds it creates. So by crushing first and letting the enzyme work its magic before cooking, one can delay the loss of function. Even better though, just like we can add broccoli enzymes in the form of raw radish or mustard powder to boost the benefits of broccoli, the addition of a little raw garlic juice to cooked garlic can restore the full complement of antiplatelet activity that was completely lost without the raw garlic addition. When onions are cooked, the 
antiplatelet activity is similarly abolished within 10 minutes, but then something strange happens. After 20 or 30 minutes of cooking, the effect on platelets is reversed and appears to make matters worse. Significant proplatelet activation effects, suggesting that extensively cooked onions may stimulate rather than inhibit platelets. This was in a test tube, though. Thankfully, when tested in people, even when onions are dropped in boiling water, fried for 10 minutes, and then left to simmer for 30, platelet activation drops within an hour and three hours after onion soup ingestion. Though the underlying cause of Alzheimer's disease has yet to be found, there's an increasing burden of proof on the role of metals in the development of the disease. Iron and copper, for example, strongly concentrated within the plaques and tangles that represent the hallmarks of the Alzheimer's brain. Alzheimer's disease victims have higher levels of copper in their blood and in the fluid that surrounds their brain and inside their brain. Here's a slice of Alzheimer's disease brain tissue showing the amyloid plaques corresponding to the copper hotspots. Copper may then make these amyloid plaques more toxic, leading to increased oxidative stress. Free copper is extremely efficient in the generation of free radicals. And when copper is removed with a chelating drug, the free radical oxidation drops. Unfortunately, when researchers tried giving that drug to nine Alzheimer's patients in a pilot study, it did not seem to have any effect on slowing the clinical progression of the disease, so maybe we need to prevent the copper buildup in the first place. Organ meats and shellfish are the richest food sources of copper, but should we also consider cutting down on plant sources, such as nuts, seeds, legumes, and whole grains? Copper intake only seems to be a problem when consumed with saturated fat or trans fat. In the Chicago Health and Aging Project, thousands of elderly Chicagoans were followed for six years. Those who were getting the highest copper doses, largely from multivitamin supplements, combined with a diet high in saturated fats, lost cognition as if they aged 19 years in a period of six years, tripling their rate of cognitive decline but copper intake was not associated with cognitive change when the diet was also not high in saturated fats. Diet-induced high cholesterol has been shown to increase the formation and progression of amyloid plaques in the brain, and dietary copper may interfere with clearance of amyloid from the brain and may further promote the plaque accumulation that results from elevated cholesterol levels. Copper has been shown to interact badly with amyloid, causing its clumping and the production of uh, hydrogen peroxide, a potent prooxidant neurotoxin. This may explain why the higher the levels of copper, the quicker Alzheimer's disease may progress, particularly those with high cholesterol levels. This is how the cholesterol levels from the saturated fat consumption and the metals interact. This is what we think is happening. As uh, cholesterol and copper levels rise, cholesterol is incorporated into the nerve cell membrane, causing it to stiffen. The amyloid protein in the membrane detaches to form plaques, at which iron and copper generate these neurotoxic free radicals. Inside the cell, similar havoc is created, and finally cholesterol-enriched diets can lead to nerve cell death, DNA damage, and blood-brain barrier disruption. In conclusion, present systematic review suggests that a diet rich in copper and iron might aggravate the detrimental effects of a high intake of cholesterol and saturated fat on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So diets rich in saturated fat and deficient in antioxidants appear to promote the onset of the disease, while more plant-based diets would likely suppress its onset. There are Compounds in plant foods that not only scavenge free radicals and prevent oxidative damage, but also known to chelate or bind up metals, potentially making them additionally protective against the onset of Alzheimer's. Therefore, the practical implications could be to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, avoid copper-containing supplements, and avoid high intakes of saturated fat and excessive iron intake. on 
April Fool's Day, 1998, the FDA approved the artificial sweetener sucralose, uh, aka 1,6-dichloro-1,6-didioxy-beta-defructofuranosyl, say that five times fast, 4-chloro-4-deoxy-alpha-D-galactoparanosyl. But despite its scary-sounding name, the worst it seemed to do was just be a rare migraine trigger in susceptible individuals to which the manufacturer of sucralose replied that, look, you have to weigh whatever risk there may be against its broader health benefits, helping to mitigate the health risks associated with our national epidemic of obesity. That's what the hope was, to provide a healthy sugar substitute, to provide a sweet taste without the calories or spikes in blood sugar. However, that's not how it appears to have turned out. With population studies tying consumption of artificial sweeteners, mainly in diet sodas, with increased risk of developing obesity, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. But an association is not causation. You've got to put it to the test. And indeed, if you give obese individuals the amount of sucralose found in like a can of diet soda, they get a significantly higher blood sugar spike in response to a sugar challenge, requiring significantly more insulin—20% higher insulin levels in the blood, suggesting sucralose causes insulin resistance, potentially helping to explain the links between artificial sweetener consumption and the development of diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. So you know, sucralose is not like some inert substance. It affects the blood sugar response. But how? The Splenda company emphasizes that sucralose is hardly even absorbed into the body, and so stays in the digestive tract to be quickly eliminated from the body. But the fact that it's not absorbed in the small intestine means it makes it down to the large intestine, and may affect our gut flora. Uh, there had been studies done on artificial sweeteners in the gut bacteria of rats going back years, but there had never been any human studies until now. They tested saccharin, sucralose, and aspartame, the artificial sweeteners in Sweet and Low, Splenda, and NutraSweet, and found that non-caloric artificial sweeteners induce glucose intolerance by altering the microbes in our gut. The human studies were limited, but after a few days on saccharin, for example, some people get exaggerated blood sugar responses tied to changes over just one week to the type of bacteria they had in their gut. Acesulfame K, another common artificial sweetener, was also found subsequently to be associated with changes in gut bacteria. So, you know, all this time, artificial sweeteners were meant to you know, stave off chronic diseases but may actually be contributing to the problem due to microbial alterations. Some in the scientific community were surprised that even minor concentrations of a sweetener— they're talking about aspartame here— are sufficient to cause substantial changes in gut inhabitants. Others were less surprised. Each molecule of aspartame is, after all, metabolized into formaldehyde. That may explain why some people who are allergic to formaldehyde have such bad reactions to the stuff. Therefore, it's not unexpected that even you know, small amounts might modify bacterial communities. Uh, the reports about the safety of aspartame are mixed. All of the studies funded by the industry vouch for its safety, whereas 90% of independently funded studies report that aspartame can cause adverse health effects, and that should tell you something. Undoubtedly, consumers of these food additives, which are otherwise perceived as safe, are unaware that these substances may influence their gut bacteria. This may be of particular importance to patients with diseases correlated with modifications of gut bacteria, such as IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. These individuals may not realize artificial sweeteners may be affecting their gut. Now, might the effect be large enough to actually see changes in the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease? Well, uh, let's look at Canada. They were the first country to approve the use of sucralose. So, I mean, what happened to their rates of IBD? Rates did seem to double after the approval of sucralose. Hmm, what about the United States? Well, after decades of relatively stable rates of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, rates did appear to start going up. In China, after the approval of sucralose, IBD rates rose 12-fold. 
Again, these could just be total flukes, but such correlations were also found on two other continents as well. Uh, you know, the more graphs that you see like this, you know, the harder it is to dismiss a possible connection. The good news is, is that after stopping artificial sweeteners, the original balance of gut bacteria may be restored within weeks. Uh, now, of course, the negative consequences of artificial sweetener should not be interpreted to suggest we should all go back to sugar and high fructose corn syrup. Right? For optimal health, it is recommended that we all try to cut down on both. The most extensive report on diet and cancer in history is constantly being updated with all the new research. In their update on colorectal cancer a few years ago, they implicated various meats, including processed meat, as a convincing cause of colorectal cancer, their highest level of evidence confirmed as a carcinogen by the World Health Organization more recently, effectively meeting beyond a reasonable doubt. The main message was that the best prevention of colorectal cancer is the combination of higher physical activity with a fiber-rich and meat product-poor diet. A decrease in half a turkey sandwich worth might lower the total number of colorectal cancer cases by approximately 20%. There are several implications of this cancer guideline update, uh, but this paper in the industry publication Meat Science decided to focus on the consumer side of the story, since in their eyes every consumer is a patient, and vice versa at some point in the future. But chronic disease need not be invariably a consequence of aging. Although the evidence for the relationship between colorectal cancer risk at least and the processed meat intake cannot be denied, they suggest further research. For example, let's compare the risk of consuming meat to other risky practices— alcohol, lack of physical activity, obesity, smoking. Compared to lung cancer and smoking, maybe meat wouldn't look so bad. But consumers probably won't even hear about the cancer prevention guidelines. Consumers today overloaded with information. It's thus probable that the dissemination of the update on colorectal cancer drowns out in the information cloud. And even if the consumers do see it, the meat industry doesn't think they'll much care. For consumers in the Western world, the role of healthfulness, although important, is not close to taste satisfaction in shaping their final choice of meat and meat products. It's hence questionable that the revised recommendations based on the carcinogenic effects of meat consumption will yield substantial changes in consumer behavior. And doctors and nutrition professionals feed into this patronizing attitude that people don't care enough about their health to change. This classic paper from a leading nutrition journal scoffed at the idea that people would ever switch to a prudent diet, reducing their intakes of animal protein and fat, no matter how much cancer was prevented. The chances of reducing consumption of fat, protein foods, or indeed any food to a significant effect to avoid colon cancer, virtually nil. Consider heart disease. Look, we know we can prevent and treat heart disease with the same kind of diet, but the public won't do it. The diet, they say, would lose too much of its palatability. The great palatability of ham, in other words, largely outweighs other considerations. Although health and well-being are increasingly important factors in consumer decisions, uh, this 1998 Meat Science article feared that unless meat eating becomes compatible with eating that is healthy and wholesome, it will be consigned to a minor role in the diet in developed countries during the next decade. Uh, their prediction didn't quite pan out. Here's meat consumption per person over the last 30 years. Rising. Rising, 1998 was when the Meat Science article was published, worrying about the next decade of meat consumption, which rose even further, but then did seem to kind of flatten out before it started falling off a cliff. Meat consumption down about 10% in recent years. Millions of Americans are cutting down on meat. So don't tell me people aren't willing to change their diets, yet we continue to get diluted guidelines and dietary recommendations because authorities are asking themselves what dietary changes could be acceptable 
to the public, rather than just telling us what the best available science says, and letting us make up our own minds about the cancer risk while feeding ourselves and our families. Raisins have a long-standing reputation as a food that promotes cavities, based on decades-old studies on rats that ranked raisins up there with cupcakes as among the most cavity-promoting foods. And to this day, you'll see dental authorities advise against eating dried fruit, like raisins. But more recent evidence done on actual people casts some doubt on the role of raisins with regards to tooth decay. The formation of cavities depends on three factors— acid, adherence, the stickiness of food to teeth, and the bacteria that make up the dental plaque. If you have a child swish some sugar water in their mouth, within five minutes the pH of the plaque on their teeth plummets as the bacteria convert the sugar to acid, and raisin bran was practically just as bad. Now, bran flakes alone without the raisins weren't as bad, but is that because the raisins and raisin bran are crusted with sugar, or because of the raisins themselves? Well, raisins didn't lead to much acid at all, and the big surprise was that if you combine the non-sugar-coated raisin with the bran flakes to create a kind of experimental raisin bran, the raisins seemed to help prevent some of the acid the bran flakes were causing. So although raisins are like 70% pure sugar, they caused less acid to be produced, so although they're sweet, they don't appear to adhere to our teeth. But, but wait, don't raisins stick to your teeth? 21 foods were put to the test, and there was actually no relationship between food retention and how sticky the foods appeared to be. Bits of cookies, crackers, and potato chips actually stuck to the teeth the longest, whereas things you'd think would stick, like caramel and raisins, disappeared within minutes though fresh fruit like apples and bananas disappeared from the mouth almost immediately. Phytonutrients in grapes appear to actually prevent the adherence of bacteria and prevent plaque formation, so much so that grape pumice, the byproduct of winemaking, is being investigated as a cavity-preventing food additive. Or you could just drink the wine. Non-alcoholic wine inhibits the growth of the primary cavity-causing bacteria, though raisins would probably be a more appropriate snack for kids. Uh, there's a new test out to measure the cavity-causing activity of plaque bacteria, and so a pilot study was performed to see if the risk for cavities increases, decreases, or remains the same after eating raisins. They took 156 folks, swabbed their teeth, waited for the readings to get up over 1,500, which indicates high cavity-causing activity, and had half eat a little box of raisins, and the other half eat nothing. In the eat-nothing control group, they started up, out up at around uh, 6,100, and 15 minutes later they were still up at 6,100. The raisin group started up around 5,950, but after raisin consumption their cavity risk score dropped down to 3,350. Uh, although that's a big reduction, note the score was still left higher than the 1,500 cutoff, indicating they were still at risk, but the risk went down after raisins, not up. Uh, so traditionally, raisins have been thought to promote tooth decay, but recent research suggests that raisins may not contribute to cavities after all, or at least not any more than other foods. In the United States, approximately one in three adults aged 65 and older have chronic kidney disease. But the majority of patients with chronic kidney disease do not progress to the advanced stages because death precedes the progression to end-stage renal disease. Following about 1,000 folks 65 years or older with chronic kidney disease for about a decade, only a few had to go on dialysis because most had to go underground. Uh, the scariest thing for many kidney patients is the fear of dialysis, but they may be 13 times more likely to die than dialysis with deaths from heart disease killing more than nearly all other causes combined, decreasing kidney function can just set one up for heart attack, strokes, and death. That's why it's critical that any diet chosen to help the kidneys must also help the heart. And a plant-based diet fits the bill, providing protection against kidney cancer 
and kidney stones, and kidney inflammation, and acidosis, as well as heart disease, uh, namely blood pressure control, maybe favored by the reduction of sodium intake, and the vegetarian nature of the diet, which is very important also for lowering serum cholesterol, which may not only help the heart, but the kidneys themselves. All the way back in 1858, Verkau, the father of modern pathology, was the first to describe the fatty degeneration of the kidney. In 1982, this idea of lipid nephrotoxicity was formalized, the possibility that fat and cholesterol in the bloodstream could be toxic to the kidneys directly, and based on data like this, showing plugs of fat literally kind of clogging up the works in autopsied kidneys. Since the notion was put forth, it has gained momentum. It appears high cholesterol and fat in the blood may accelerate progression of chronic kidney disease through direct toxic effects on the kidney cells themselves. Given the connection between cholesterol and kidney decline, the use of cholesterol-lowering statin drugs has been recommended to slow the progression of kidney disease. Of course, serious adverse effects on muscle and liver must be kept in mind. That's why plant-based diets could offer the best of both worlds, protecting the heart and the kidneys without drug side effects. The two potential drawbacks are the amount of phosphorus and potassium in plant foods, which ailing kidneys can sometimes have a problem getting rid of. But it turns out that the phosphorus in meat is absorbed at about twice the rate, uh, not to mention the phosphate additives that are injected into meat. So eating vegetarian can significantly lower phosphorus levels in the blood. The concern about potassium is largely theoretical, since the alkalizing effects of plant foods help the body excrete potassium, but not theoretical for those on dialysis or with end-stage disease who need to be followed closely by a dietitian kidney specialist. Special protein-restricted vegan diets have been used successfully to slow or stop the progression of kidney failure. Here is the declining kidney function of eight diabetics for one to two years before switching to a plant-based diet, which appeared to stop the inexorable decline in most of the patients, leading the researchers to proclaim it is the treatment of choice for diabetic kidney failure. It may also help delay dialysis by one to two years, and after a kidney transplant may improve the survival of the kidney and improve the survival of the patient, most of the papers, though, are just pilot feasibility studies. It doesn't matter if it's effective if we can't get people to stick to the diet. But while we're waiting for more definitive studies, existing data support offering these kinds of plant-based diets as an option to all patients with advanced or progressive chronic kidney disease. Even if the effects of such diets on the progression of kidney failure are still debatable, the unquestionably favorable effects of plant, uh, beneficial favorable effects on uh, plant-based diets and some of the most deleterious cardiovascular and metabolic disorders usually associated with renal failure like hypertension, diabetes, provide rationale for recommending a predominance of plant proteins for patients with failing kidneys. Yet, diet is still underutilized, in part because some people find changing their diet is difficult. Yet we know foods rich in animal protein lead to metabolic acidosis. Our diets are largely acid-producing because they are deficient in fruits and vegetables and contain large amounts of animal products. And so what did doctors do? They gave people baking soda. Instead of treating the cause, the dietary acid load, from too many animal products, too few fruits and vegetables, they treated the consequence by saying, oh, too much acid? Well, we'll just give you some base, sodium bicarbonate. And it works. Uh, neutralization of dietary acid with sodium bicarb decreases kidney failure and slows uh, you know, kidney function decline, but uh, sodium bicarbonate baking soda has sodium, so doctors may just be adding another problem. 
Now, if patients are not going to cut back on animal products, at least they should uh, be eating more fruits and vegetables. And so they tried that, and look, it worked too, and with it doing so without leading to too much potassium in the blood. And it may work even better, as fruits and vegetables have the additional advantage of helping to lower blood pressure. Uh, this study is important because it illustrates a very simple and safe way to treat metabolic acidosis, fruits and vegetables. So the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney disease might be in the produce market, not in the pharmacy. Different autoimmune diseases tend to target different organs. If our immune system attacks the insulin-producing cells in our pancreas, we can end up with type 1 diabetes. If our immune system attacks our thyroid gland, we can end up with hypothyroidism. But in the autoimmune disease lupus, our immune system attacks the very nucleus of our cells, often producing antibodies and attacking our DNA itself, so it can damage any organ system and result in almost any complication. Women are nine times as likely to get it, and the peak age is too often at the peak of life. Hundreds of thousands, or even millions of Americans, suffer from this dreaded disease. One of the most common organ-threatening manifestations is kidney inflammation, occurring in as many as half of the patients. It's also one of the most serious, caused by the disease itself, or as a result of intense immunosuppressive drug toxicity. Chemo drugs like cytoxin, uh, cyclophosphamide, with severe life-threatening side effects that may include leukemia and bladder cancer, as many women lose their hair and become permanently infertile. Uh, there's a desperate need for better treatments. Oral supplementation of the spiced turmeric decreases protein urea, hematuria, and systolic blood pressure, the cardinal clinical manifestations in patients suffering from relapsing or refractory, meaning untreatable, lupus kidney inflammation, a randomized and double-blind placebo-controlled study. Here's the proteinuria data, an ominous prognostic sign, the spilling of protein into the urine. In the control group, three people got better, three people got worse, and the rest pretty much stayed the same. In the turmeric group, one got worse, one stayed the same, but the rest all got better. Note they said turmeric, the whole spice, not curcumin, which is an extracted component often given in pill form. They took women with out-of-control lupus and just had them take like a quarter teaspoon of turmeric with each meal for three months. In my local supermarket, that would come out to be about a nickel a dose, compared to mm, $35,000 a year for one of the latest lupus drugs. Which of the two treatments do you imagine doctors are more likely to be told about? Our endothelium, the inner lining of our blood vessels that controls the function of every artery in our body, appears to play a critical role in a variety of human disorders, including peripheral vascular disease, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, kidney failure, cancer, and blood clots. Unfortunately, endothelial cells only live about 30 years, and their replacements don't seem to function as well. So as men and women approach the ages of 40 and 50, there's a progressive decline in endothelial function. At age 50 or 60, we can no longer tolerate the risk factor burden that we were once able to tolerate as teenagers, thanks to this progressive decline in endothelial function. But that's what we used to think. There are increasing data to suggest that age is not an immutable risk factor. In a Chinese population studied, for example, they did not see the progressive decline. The older Chinese in their 60s had the arterial function of young folks in their 20s. These data suggest that progressive endothelial function is not an inevitable consequence of aging, but might be related to prolonged exposure to environmental factors more prevalent in westernized countries than in China. What could it be? Well, traditional Chinese diets include green tea, which has been shown to have a beneficial effect on endothelial function within 30 minutes of consumption, lasting about two hours. It wasn't the caffeine, which alone had no effect. They suspect it's the flavonoid uh, phytonutrients in the tea leaves. Black tea, 
appears to work about just as well as green tea. But then why is green tea associated with lower heart disease risk, but black tea not? In fact, in two British studies, tea consumption was associated with increased risk of coronary artery disease. Maybe it's because the Brits drink their tea with milk, whereas green tea is typically drank straight. You know, if only there was a country that drank black tea but without milk. There is, the Netherlands. And in those studies, black tea was associated with the same drop in risk as the green tea studies. So maybe it is the milk. But you really can't know until you put it to the test. They found the addition of milk to black tea completely prevents the biological activity of tea in terms of improvement of endothelial function. And so that could explain it. It appears casein is the culprit, the milk protein casein, though soy protein was recently found to have the same nutrient-binding effect. The European Society of Cardiology issued a press release about the study, showing the protective effect of tea was totally wiped out by adding milk, and suggested consumers should consider cutting down. Milk drinkers were not amused. As long as the reported results are not confirmed in a fair number of humans who drink their tea outside the lab setting, we will continue to add milk to ours. The researchers responded. Challenging the notion that their study wasn't big enough, they had 16 people, and the results were highly significant. Across those 16 people, the addition of milk to tea not only reduced, but completely blunted the effects of the tea. And uh, the rationale for drinking tea in a lab setting was because they were doing an experiment? <laughs> were they supposed to drag the equipment to Starbucks or something? As doctors, the milky tea drinker is asserted, just as we would not prescribe a new drug to patients if it was studied only in one small study, milk abstinence should not be recommended to tea drinkers, apparently forgetting that the reason we don't prescribe drugs without overwhelming evidence is because drugs can kill. So the benefits better outweigh the risks, but what's the downside of a little milk abstinence? Endothelial dysfunction is the initial step in the development of peripheral artery disease, heart disease, and stroke. The remarkable finding that progressive endothelial dysfunction, the decline in the functioning of our arteries, is not an inevitable consequence of aging, that we can retain the arterial function we had in our 20s into our 60s, like the elderly Chinese, may in part be due to green tea, but other important dietary differences include increased consumption of vegetables and fish, with lower consumption of other meat and dairy in the traditional Chinese diet, which may be contributing to the protection observed in older Chinese arteries. It's probably not the fish. Uh, pooling all the best double-blind placebo-controlled studies found that fish oil supplementation has no significant effect on endothelial function, and by far the largest study done to date, comparing doses of fish oil equivalent to one, two, or four servings of fish per week. No effects of these long-chain omega-3 fats were found. This is consistent with studies that have looked at whole fish consumption as well. Overall, no significant association between fish intake and endothelial function. In fact, in women, those eating the most fish had the worst arterial function. Women who ate fish more than twice a week had significantly impaired endothelial function compared to those who never or only rarely ate fish. Uh, so if it's not the fish, maybe it's the plants. Vegetarian diets appear to have a directly beneficial effect on endothelial function. Vegetarian arteries dilate four times better than omnivore arteries. Maybe it's just because vegetarians tend to smoke less? Uh, within five minutes of smoking a single cigarette, our endothelium is brought to its knees, completely clamped down. And this happens if you're a smoker or simply breathing in secondhand smoke. But this study excluded all smokers completely. The beneficial effects were independent of non-dietary risk factors. In fact, a healthy diet may even trump smoking. The preservation of endothelial function in older Chinese may help explain why they had such low heart attack rates despite 
their high prevalence of cigarette smoking. And the improved arterial function was well correlated with the duration of eating vegetarian. The longer they ate healthy, the better their endothelial function appeared to be. This was a cross-sectional study, though a snapshot in time, so you can't prove cause and effect. Uh, what we need is an interventional trial. Put people on a plant-based diet and see if their arterial function improves, which is exactly what Dr. Dean Ornish did, showing a significant boost in arterial function compared to control. Is this just some intangible risk factor test result, though, or does it actually have real-world implications? Are their arteries naturally dilating so much better that their chest pain actually improves? Ornish showed that on his plant-based diet and lifestyle program, cardiac patients had a 91% reduction in angina attacks. In contrast, control group patients who were instead told to follow the advice of their physicians had a 186% increase in reported angina attacks. This marked reduction in frequency, severity, duration of angina chest pain was sustained five years later, um, uh, of uh, five years of eating healthy, a long-term reduction in angina comparable to that of surgery, but without the knife. But this is back in the 90s, when Ornish was only studying a few dozen patients at a time. How about a thousand patients put on a healthy lifestyle track with a whole food plant-based diet? Within three months, nearly three-quarters of angina patients became angina-free. The Dean Ornish program that led to the improvement in arterial function and the dramatic drop in angina attacks is not just about putting people on a plant-based diet. It also involves recommendations for moderate exercise, stress management, and we know exercise alone can improve endothelial function. Uh, so how do we know diet had anything to do with it? Well, if you go back to Ornish's first publication, he put cardiac patients on a quasi-vegan diet with no added exercise, just diet and stress management, and got the same 91% reduction in angina attacks within just 24 days. And Dr. Esselstyn was able to improve angina using a plant-based diet as the only lifestyle intervention. We have published case series going back to the 1970s documenting this, angina and vegan diet, like uh, Mr. F.W. here, uh, chest pain so severe he had to stop every nine or ten steps, couldn't even make it to the mailbox, started on a vegan diet, and a few months later, climb mountains, no pain. We know plant-based diets can reverse heart disease, uh, dissolving plaque away, opening up arteries in some cases without drugs, without surgery, but that doesn't happen in 24 days. The improvements in anginal symptoms are, are too rapid, too great, to be explained by the gradual regression of the atherosclerotic plaque. So maybe it's that improvement in endothelial function that's doing it. What is it about plant-based diets that improves our arteries' ability to dilate? Is it uh, macronutrient differences, simply the lack of the deleterious effect of meat? Uh, maybe it's the drop in cholesterol. Endothelial function improves if we lower our cholesterol low enough by any means necessary. This study took PET scans measuring blood flow to the heart before and after three radically different ways to lower cholesterol. The first method used drugs. The second a low-fat diet, a really low-fat diet. And the third, no diet at all, 90 days without food. They had a central line place to basically drip enriched sugar water straight into their bloodstream for three months. These researchers were not messing around. And no exercise or stress management treatments. They wanted to isolate out the effect of cholesterol lowering on cardiac blood flow. They started out with miserable cholesterol levels, and the diminished blood flow to their hearts to prove it. The dark blue areas represent so-called perfusion deficits, areas of the heart muscle that aren't getting adequate blood flow. After cholesterol lowering, their cholesterol was still terrible, but with the improvement, there was an improvement in blood flow, and their angina attacks were cut in half. 
And when they stopped and their cholesterol went back up, the blood flow to their heart muscle went back down. So cholesterol lowering itself appears to improve blood flow to the heart, and they think it's because when cholesterol goes down, endothelial function improves. There's a new category of anti-angina drugs, but before committing billions of dollars of public and private monies to dishing them out, maybe we should take a more serious and respectful look at dietary strategies that are demonstrably highly effective for treating angina, and have also been shown to reduce subsequent cardiac disease. To date, these strategies have been marginalized by the drug-pusher mentality of orthodox medical practice. Presumably, you know, doctors feel that most patients would be unwilling or unable to make the substantial dietary changes required. Uh, look, while this may be true for many patients, certainly not true for all. And in any case, in China, patients deserve to be offered the Ornish or Esselstyn diet alternative before being shunted to expensive surgery or to drug therapies that can have a range of side effects and never really get to the root of the problem. In response, a drug company executive wrote in to the medical journal, Although diet and lifestyle modification should be part of a disease management, many patients may be not able to comply with the substantial dietary changes required to achieve a vegan diet. So, of course, everyone should go on their fancy new drug, uh, called ranolazine. It uh, costs thousands of dollars a year to take it, but it works. Uh, collectively, the studies show at the highest dose, the fancy new drug may prolong exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. It doesn't look like those choosing the drug route will be climbing mountains anytime soon. Currently, an estimated 10 million Americans suffer from osteoporosis, causing more than a million fractures, including hundreds of thousands of hip fractures, a common reason people end up in nursing homes. Many older women say they'd rather be dead than break their hip and end up in a home. Bone is a dynamic, living organ that's constantly renewed through a process of remodeling and modeling involving bone breakdown by cells that eat bone, called osteoclasts, and bone formation by cells that build bone, called osteoblasts. Osteoporosis is caused by an imbalance between bone loss and bone gain, most often related to hormonal changes that occur during menopause. Is there anything we can do to help tip the balance back in bones favor. There are a number of specific compounds in plant foods that look promising, uh, but that's based on like in vitro studies like this, where they basically drip some plant compound on bone cells in a petri dish, and do see a boost in bone builder cells, or a, a drop in bone eater cells. Uh, but no matter how much people like cranberry sauce, they're not injecting it into their veins. For phytonutrients to reach the bone, they first have to get absorbed from the digestive tract into the bloodstream, make it past the liver, before they can circulate to our skeleton. So what would be nice is a so-called ex vivo study, where you take people, feed them a food or not, and then draw their blood a few hours later, and then drip their blood on bone cells and see if there's any difference. But nothing like that had ever been attempted until this study. Normally, I'm not impressed with studies funded by marketing boards who pay for studies like this that found that eating almonds improved cycling distance and athletic performance compared to cookies. But this study was rather brilliant, not surprisingly, given it was performed in the world-famous lab of Dr. David Jenkins. There was a population study that suggested that eating almonds could protect against osteoporosis, so what they could have just you know, done is drip some almond extract on bone cells, but that's not testing the whole food. Instead, you could treat bone cells with the blood obtained from donors fed the whole food to directly test the effects of these foods at the cellular level. So, they exposed human osteoclasts, the bone eaters, to blood obtained before and four hours after eating a handful of almonds. 
Uh, but wait a second, before I get to the results, I mean, if you ate a handful of almonds every day, I mean, wouldn't you gain weight that's almost 200 calories? Let's find out. If you add a handful, or a handful and a half, like 35 almonds as a snack, in addition to women's regular diet as a mid-morning snack, and then told them, you know, eat as much as you want for lunch and supper that day, people eat less. In fact, so much less, they cancel out the nut calories. Uh, they all had the same breakfast, then zero, 173, or 259 calories worth of almonds as a snack then ate as much lunch as they wanted, but the nuts appeared to be so satiating that they ate less for lunch or dinner, such that at the end of the day there was no significant difference in total caloric intake between any of the three groups. Part of the reason people don't tend to gain weight adding nuts to their diet may be because we end up flushing nearly a third of the calories down the toilet because we don't chew well enough. Uh, this is why we think there's so much less fat in our bloodstream after eating whole almonds compared to the same amount of almond oil taken out of the same quantity of nuts, but in oil form. So anyway, they wanted to see if they could suppress the activity of the cells that eat away our bones. And they found that blood serum obtained following the consumption of an almond meal inhibits human osteoclast formation and function and gene expression, providing direct evidence to support the association between regular almond consumption and a reduced risk of developing osteoporosis. They also tried before and after eating other meals, uh, rice or potatoes, to make sure it wasn't just some effective eating in general. And no, the, the protective effect did appear specific to the almonds. Chlorophyll is the green pigment that makes green leaves green. If one searches for chlorophyll in the medical literature, though, a lot of what you find is about fecal fluorescence, a, a way to detect the contamination of carcasses with feces in the slaughterhouse, uh, to reduce the risk of food poisoning from pathogens harbored within animal feces. Um, see, fecal matter gets on meat either through knife, with knife entry through the hide into the carcass, and also splash back and airborne deposition of fecal matter when you're peeling off the skin. But if they've been eating grass, you can pick up the poo with a black light. Here's a solution of chlorophyll. Under a UV light, though, chlorophyll lights up as red. So if you have a black light in the chicken slaughter plant, you can get a drop on the droppings. The problem is we don't let chickens outside anymore, right? They're no longer pecking at grass, so there's less fecal fluorescence. We could let them run around, but it would save money. Just add a chlorophyll supplement to their feed, so then you can better identify the areas of gut spill contamination on the meat. The reason I was looking up chlorophyll was to follow up on the data I presented in my Eating Green to Prevent Cancer video, suggesting that chlorophyll may be able to block carcinogens. There were a few in vitro studies I found, in addition on the potential anti-inflammatory effects of chlorophyll. I mean, after all, green leaves have long been used to treat inflammation, so anti-inflammatory properties of chlorophyll and their breakdown products after digestion was put to the test. And indeed, they may represent valuable and abundantly available anti-inflammatory agents. Maybe that's one reason why cruciferous veggies like kale and collard greens are associated with decreased markers of inflammation. In a petri dish, for example, if you lay down a layer of arterial lining cells, this is how many inflammatory immune cells stick to them before and after you stimulate them with a toxic substance. We can bring that inflammation down, though, with the anti-inflammatory drug aspirin, or even more by just adding some chlorophyll, just dripping some chlorophyll on it. Uh, perhaps that's one of the reasons kale consumers may live longer lives. This is the study, though, that blew my mind. Sunlight is the most abundant energy source on this planet. So far, so good. However, only plants are able to use it directly, or so we thought. After eating plants, animals have chlorophyll in them too, right? Might we be able to derive energy directly from sunlight? What? Okay, first of all, light can't get through our skin, right? 
wrong, as was demonstrated by century-old science and any kid who's ever shined a flashlight through their fingers. Right? The red wavelengths do get through. In fact, if you step outside on a sunny day, there's enough light going through your skull into your brain you could read a book in there. OK, so our internal organs are actually bathed in sunlight and absorbed chlorophyll right, when we eat green leafy vegetables. I mean, our body does actually appear to produce cellular energy, but unless we ate so many greens we turned green ourselves, the energy produced is probably negligible. However, light-activated chlorophyll inside our body may help regenerate coenzyme Q10. CoQ10 is an antioxidant our body basically makes from scratch, using the same enzyme that our body uses to make cholesterol, the, the same enzyme that's blocked by cholesterol-lowering statin drugs. So if CoQ10 production gets kind of caught in the crossfire, then you know, maybe that explains why statins increase our risk of diabetes by accidentally also kind of reducing CoQ10 levels in this kind of friendly fire event. Maybe that's why statins can lead to muscle breakdown. So should statin users take CoQ10 supplements? No, they should improve their diet sufficient to stop taking drugs that muck with their biochemistry. And by doing so, by eating more plant-based, kind of chlorophyll-rich diets, they may best maintain their levels of active CoQ10, also known as ubiquinol. Uh, however, when ubiquinol is used as an antioxidant, it's oxidized into ubiquinone, and to act as an effective antioxidant again, the body must regenerate ubiquinol from ubiquinone, maybe using dietary chlorophyll metabolites and light. So they put it to the test. They expose some ubiquinone and chlorophyll metabolites to the kind of light that makes it into our bloodstream, and poof! CoQ10 was reborn. But without the chlorophyll, or without the light, nothing happened. And look, we got light, we got chlorophyll for eating our veggies, right? so maybe that's how human beings maintain such high levels of CoQ10 in our bloodstream. Maybe that explains why dark green leafy veggies are so good for us. I mean, we know sun can be good for us, we know greens can be good for us, but these benefits were commonly attributed to the increase in vitamin D from sunlight exposure and all the antioxidants and green vegetables, but maybe these explanations might be incomplete.